Uh, for those of you who did not hear, this panel is titled Leading the Pack and Scaling to Own a Defined Category. And once again, we've got Thomas Knox as our moderator. We've got Brian Fox and Catherine Ledesma as our panel members. All right, I'm going to ask you all to grab your microphones there so everybody can hear you, both here and the folks who are listening in with our stream. And away we go. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Dave. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Knox with King & Spaulding. It's a global law firm, but we have a, a four-decade presence here in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm joined by uh, colleagues uh, Charlie Katz and Dan Kahan here. Um, I feel like it, it's an abundance of blessings for us. We uh, serve as corporate counsel to many of the speakers, um, including our friends at Virtru and at Notography, and also uh, we work from have worked for many years with Sonatype. So uh, it's uh, really fantastic to see so many friends here, and we're going to have a very interesting conversation today. Um, the uh, progression of the panels is uh, to uh, be talking to ever larger companies about their position in the marketplace. And of course, we're going to finish uh, with a government uh, panel, which is, I guess, the largest of enterprises. Uh, but uh, Dave is absolutely right. I mean, this is about, uh, we're going to be talking with a couple of uh, representatives of a couple of the companies that are really in the vanguard uh, here in the DMV uh, cybersecurity tech scene, uh, their models for what some of the smaller companies would like to become. And they're really setting the standard in their particular uh, areas. Uh, so first, let me uh, make a few words of introduction of our panelists. Um, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on biography because we have lots to discuss in terms of policy and innovation. Uh, but first, Brian Fox. Brian is founder and CTO of Sonatype, as I mentioned. He's a member of the Apache Software uh, Foundation and the former chair of the Apache Maven project. Uh, he's on the board of the Open Source Security Foundation and a member of the Atlantic Council's Open Source Policy Network. Brian is a thought leader, writer, and speaker on open source and cybersecurity topics. So we'll be fascinated to hear what you have to think about the intersection of policy and product. Kate Ledesma is Vice President, Public Policy and Government Affairs at Dragos. She's a former senior policy advisor for CISA. She's a former deputy chief of staff for the Office of Infrastructure Protection at DHS. She led government affairs for the cybersecurity firm Security Scorecard. Uh, she managed resilience initiatives for the electricity ISAC, and she's held various positions within DHS and Department of State. So with that, I'd like to ask you, Brian, to provide an, just a quick introduction to Sonatype. It is kind of a household or name here in the DMV, uh, but we'd love to get just a refresher on Sonatype and its approach to innovation. And then, Kate, I'll ask you to do the same thing with respect to Dragos, just to, just to, to uh, set the context here. Sure. Thanks for having me, everybody. Good to see everybody here. Um, so Sonatype, we started 17 years ago um, on uh, the open source project Apache Maven. And um, Apache Maven is the build system for Java. It's the most popular build system that's out there. Um, and uh, it, it works by fetching pre-built binaries from a, a repository called Maven Central. Through a fluke of history, Sonatype has always run this repository. So what that means is everybody in the world doing Java development, you're getting your dependencies from us, right? So that's a pretty big responsibility that we have and, and not a lot of people realize that that's what's happening. So uh, behind the scenes there, you know, that, that uh, visibility that that affords us led us down multiple different paths of, of innovation to create couple of different spaces. We were the first to monetize the repository management market um, for caching these binaries and managing these dependencies from all the package managers. Later, um, we made the observation that uh, users were making terrible choices about which versions of which dependencies they were using. And so that led us to basically create what is now called the software composition analysis space to help organizations understand and manage those dependencies. And then more recently, we saw um, this is uh, around 2017, we saw a new rise of 
intentional malware phishing types of attacks on the repositories and these fake dependencies. And so we've been uh, really working to create yet another sector there, which is trying to help uh, protect organizations from open source malware uh, in their supply chain. So that's a, that's a bit of our, our background. Thanks, Brian. Kate? Yeah, thank you for having me back this year. It's good to be back. Um, so for those of you, I think many of you are familiar with Dracos, um, but we are an industrial control systems and operational technology cybersecurity firm um, located here in the DMV area. Um, we arm asset owners, operators, and defenders with the tools and intelligence that they need to protect um, their systems, much of which is our nation's critical infrastructure. Thanks, Kate. So uh, I promised that we would talk about product innovation and uh, many uh, technologists in the area look to you uh, to see how it is that you not only became relevant many years ago, but stay relevant and stay on the leading edge of what customers always want. So, Kate, can I ask you, how is it that, how, how do you interact with customers and and figure out what they need, look over their horizon for them. And can you give an example or two of how your products and services have evolved to meet customer needs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you've heard it, we've heard it today a couple of times, but it's um, solve a problem. So um, that is what our, our founders did um, uh, back in 2016 is, is they, they saw a problem. We weren't adequately addressing operational technology cybersecurity. We were doing IT cybersecurity kind of well, um, but we needed a new approach for, for OT cybersecurity. Um, I kind of like to talk about it in my world, the policy world, right? Where I'm a translator for our very technical team um, to policymakers and lawmakers, but it's like learning Spanish for a trip to France. The languages are kind of similar and maybe you can understand a lot of it, um, but you're still gonna have trouble communicating um, if you don't study French before you go to France. So they, they saw a need, they saw a problem, and, and um, they listened to um, our, their future customers at the time, and we listened to our customers today um, to make sure that we're still solving a problem. I think that's kind of how you stay relevant, and you, 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 you capture that market and stay relevant to your customers is by continuing to solve problems for them. And I think today what that looks like is um, – being an advocate for our customers, and then also making sure that um, what we are advocating for um, in the policy world, what we're seeing in the regulatory world um, is reflected in our product offering. So for example, um, looking at the upcoming um, NERC um, and internal network secure, um, internal network monitoring requirements, um, you know, we're making sure that our, our products and our services can meet the need of our customers who are either currently Drago's customers or future Drago's customers um, to meet that requirement um, from that particular regulator. And I think, you know, from my world, which is the policy world, um, it's bi-directional. So it's knowing what's coming um, in the policy and regulatory space. It's being an advocate for our customers um, or for the, the sectors, regardless of whether they're a customer or not, um, making sure that we are talking to policymakers, talking to lawmakers, to make sure that as requirements, as regulations are um, being drafted, they are informed not only by cybersecurity experts um, outside of the government too, but also asset owners and operators who ultimately are going to have to implement. And also make sure that those requirements are actually buying down risk and they're not just another compliance requirement, right? At the end of the day, the goal is security and buying down risk. And so um, we also serve as an advocate for uh, customers and sectors as well. Thanks, Kate. Brian, how do you respond to the voice of the customer or is it, are you ahead of the customer in some cases? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matt knows this. Um, I've been uh, many times accused of being a contrarian, uh, which is a, a, a funny place to be, but um, you end up finding some innovation, I think, within that. So um, many times, you know, in the early days when we started, um, you know, I personally flew around to a lot of big companies and taught their people how to use Maven because it was new and hot and nobody knew how to do it. And that was sort of how we funded before, before our A round. And um, one of the things that kept happening at that time, I was, I was trying to teach them how to modernize their, their, their supply chain, basically. And the question kept coming up, but 
we have these rules about how we manage our open source and it takes forever to get approvals. And so like, it, it, it wasn't my goal to set out and solve that problem, but it was something that kept coming up over and over and over again. And so, you know, as we started really looking into it, you know, the approach I took was to look at existing solutions that were out there and try to really understand why they were failing for the current customer. So at that time, you know, the, the lingo was all about open source governance. Black Duck was a very big company at that point. They were solving a specific problem that wasn't quite, uh, it was a little bit adjacent to us. They were solving a problem of developers cutting and pasting code. Whereas with Maven and, and all the modern packaging systems, people weren't doing that anymore. They were taking whole binaries. And so we saw a lot of customers that were trying to sort of force fit this this tool that was made for one problem into this other problem. So we we took a step back and you know looked for where is the the blue ocean. You know it was a very red ocean in solving this other problem, and it wasn't well suited for this new one. So it led to the innovation and taking a step back and saying you know like these other tools they take a whole day to do the assessment. They produce a ton of false positives. It's a mm -hmm. ton of work for people to work through. As a as a, yeah. a legal firm, you know, yeah, we know. Talking about, yeah. Um, if you're trying to find reasons to squash a price on an M and A, it's a great approach. Absolutely. If you're trying to actually ship software faster, it is very much not. Um, and so, so you know, we looked at at the gaps there, and you know, the the other challenge that you have when you're sort of leading the customers is they don't know what what they want. They don't actually understand the state of the possible. They're stuck, kind of, you know looking at their feed while they're running, right? And so it's very hard to try to navigate that that model of they're, they're asking, you know, the old adage, they're asking for faster horses, right? And and um, trying to figure out how to get them forward. So, you know, I, I used this technique, it was very frustrating to Wayne, um, you know, uh, our CEO at the time until he understood what I was doing. But it turns out later I found out there's a term for it. It's called Cunningham's Law. It's sort of this observation. The best way to get the right answer on the internet is to post the wrong answer, right? <laughs> Matt knows this. I've done this to Matt a thousand times. It drives me crazy. But, you know, I'll ask a question what, that I know is wrong, right? Because especially when you're dealing with technical folks, they don't want to tell you a lot. But if you can get them agitated enough where they think you're dumb, they're going to tell you a whole bunch of reasons why you're wrong. And, and if I already knew those answers, then it was great. I got confirmation. But if they were telling me something I hadn't heard before, now I learned something. So the way I kind of architected the, the early solution was every customer meeting I went into, I would pose, um, you know, I, I would draw a picture for them. of I'm thinking about solving this problem. and Here's how I'm thinking about solving it and then let them poke all the holes in it. Many of them I knew were holes and some of them I didn't. And then I would iterate that to the next one. And when I got to the point where I was talking to prospects um, and they were basically saying, yeah, when can I buy that? They no longer could poke holes in it. Then we knew what we needed to go and build, right? And so that was sort of how I navigated this problem of like, we could see that there was a need but the customers couldn't tell us what they wanted it to do. They could only tell me all the things why what I was proposing wasn't going to work for them, you know, over and over until until we got there. So, you know, that was that was my approach to basically figuring out how to define that. Yeah, that, that faster horses problem is. It, it, I remember that Steve Jobs was once once asked why he didn't do uh, customer surveys. He said because the customer doesn't know what it, what he wants. That's exactly right. Yeah. We have to develop it for them, but it's a delicate balance because you could build something that that doesn't have a product market fit, right? So that's always the challenge. Are there examples, Kate, in Dragos's uh, history of situations where a, a product didn't quite fit and had to be adjusted to make a better fit? Well, I think you know the the. The very concept of tools for operational technology cybersecurity didn't exist 10 years ago. And so when you're really creating a market, um, you're going to, it's going to evolve very, very quickly. Um, and I think that's, you know, really been the story of Dragos is iterate, iterating and listening to our customers. Um, I think another thing that we did really, really well is we stayed focused on what we did really well. And I think in early stage companies. We love to use the word pivot. We love agile, which is fantastic, especially when you juxtapose that with maybe the way some of um, 
our government customers work. Um, we're able to sort of meet in the middle and move things a little bit more quickly. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we're not chasing shiny objects um, when we're being agile or, or making pivots. And I think that's what, what Dragos has done really well is we know what we do well. That's what we do. We're not trying to be everything to everyone. Um, and we built our subject matter expertise. We built our teams around what we do really well. And I think the other thing is we're fully integrated. So the Dragos platform gives customers insights into or visibility into their assets, threat intelligence, um, vulnerabilities, response actions. We also have a world-class professional services team and threat intelligence team. Um, but I think where we are, what our strength is, is that our um, we are able to fully integrate the insights from the services teams and the Intel teams into um, our software. And so that's, you know, I think over the years since we've done really well, we've integrated those things. So there's nothing wasted. Everything is fully integrated, delivering value to our customers where they need it. Um, and we're really focused on what we do well. So you've both mentioned policy, and I know you're both quite immersed in policy initiatives and on uh, boards and, and the like. Uh, tell me how, the, and, and Kate, you mentioned policy in your introductory remarks. H how has the uh, evolution of policy and the government effectively catching up on a lot of these cybersecurity uh, matters? And maybe the latest example is uh, the executive order on safety and AI, but there are many that preceded it and, and will follow it. How does that shape product and service development? And Brian, let's start with you. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot. I could talk about this for hours. Um, you know, the executive order, you're talking about the, the, the SBOM executive order, I think, from a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, fun, fun fact, um, 2014, there was a, a bill on Congress that didn't get anywhere called the Royce Bill that called for software bills of materials. Just stop and think for a minute, if we had true software transparency a decade ago, how different all of these modern attacks have, would, would be. They wouldn't exist or would be so much further down the path, right? And so that's a cross I have to bear. It's deeply troubling and frustrating. That, that you weren't personally able to get that bill passed? Is that your, your we, concern? We, we helped get it drafted. Yeah. Um, we couldn't get it over the, to the finish line, but the yeah. fact that, um, you know, we're so many of these problems we're dealing with in the software supply chain today were uh, very visible, knowable more than a decade ago, and yet we're, you know, uh, still struggling with it today is is frustrating. You know, after the log for shell incident three years ago was, I think, when industry and regulators finally woke up and everybody was having this collective freak out. And, you know, my eyes were rolling out of my head because I'm like, hey, welcome to the party, everybody. This is what we've been doing for you know, at that point, 12 years. Um, you know, so the policy is catching up, um, but organizations are not moving fast enough. Uh, we we um, just finished some of the research for our 10th annual State of the Software Supply Chain Report. It comes out uh, on 1010. And I can tell you that while the graph for the growth of S-bombs looks really great, you know, it's up and to the right, just like you would want. When you actually put that same graph on the number of new components, you can't even see the growth. You barely can even see the bars for how many new S bombs are getting created. So we're not even at a point where we're starting to, to pay down the technical debt, if you will. We are still digging the hole deeper and deeper as we sit right now. Is that all, all projects or just all projects? Used? All projects. Yeah. Um, and so so that you know, in other words, the growth of new things is far outpacing the growth of new S bombs, right? And so we're still in the infancy of, of, of that uh, part of the yeah. problem. And, and you're experiencing a, a massive growth in, of injection of, of malware binaries, right? That, that's into the whole, ecosystem. That's a whole parallel problem. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge growth of this intentional uh, injection of, of malware into the supply chain. The number doubled again last year. It's now over 700,000 um, components. So, you know, we're in like the seventh year and we haven't hit the law of big numbers where, where the growth slows, it's still doubling, tripling every single year, seven years in a row. Um, and, and these are intentional attacks on these supply chains. They're, they're basically phishing attacks on your, your developer supply chain. Most organizations have no protection for this. 
Um, and, um, you know, so the, the regulation, I think, has helped moving it along. But honestly, you know, we talked about this in the roundtable. I've kind of come to the point that until until um, we get around to actually changing the fact that software can just disclaim all liability in the EULA and get away from it, I don't think the behaviors are going to change. I really don't. You know, the regulations are, are calling for point solutions. You know, the regulation to create a bill of materials is nice, but it doesn't require the organization to do anything intelligent with it. You know, and I told, I told um, you know, some of the regulators when they're asking my opinion on a strategy, I said, you know, imagine if we told the auto manufacturers they no longer had to do a recall. They didn't have to track the parts as long as they printed out a bill of materials and put it in the glove box when they sold the car. Right. It's laughable. And then and they had the same reaction. And I said, and your executive order, that's exactly what it is. They didn't like it when I pointed that out. But that's where we are today. And so, you know, we don't accept this from our physical goods manufacturers, from our food manufacturers or any of these other things. Um, it used to be the case over 100 years ago that you couldn't sue a, an auto manufacturer for a knowingly defective part uh, that predictably could have hurt someone. And yet that's what we do with our software that runs our entire society today. So until we get to a point of changing that, I think we're just we're, we're painting around the edges. I, I love that you tied it back to the legal documents, Brian. Um, but I, I see the wisdom of that. I didn't do that just for you. Though. No, no, I, I, no. Well, but the problem is that we as lawyers are the ones drafting the the exculpation from liability, right? So we're part of the problem. So that's right. Yeah, that, that's a reason for for legal solutions. Um, yeah, I did a little bit. That's where the uh, policy comes in to make that not legal. Exactly. <laughs> then you can't do it anymore. Yes, sir. Well played. Um, so, uh, Kate, uh, although policy is kind of Brian's. Uh, hobby or side job. It's in your job description. You're head of government affairs. So tell us how you interact with your product people and and um, your strategic planners to look over the horizon a bit in the case of Dragos. Yeah, well, I think first I'd love to just touch on the, the previous point because I think that you are getting at something else that's really, really important um, when it comes to Policy making and, and, and lawmaking. Um, you know, earlier the panelists talked about the talent pool and, and um, the knowledge base here in the DMV, and that's absolutely correct. And I think, you know, one thing that you were sort of alluding to is that these policies and in, in regulations as well can't be written, uh, you know, based on point in time problem um, in, a, in a government vacuum. I mean, the government has a lot of things they do really well. They have a lot of subject matter expertise that um, resides within government agencies, but so does industry, whether that's cybersecurity services or asset owners and operators who know their systems better than anyone. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned, you know, getting to to take a look at and, and provide feedback to the White House on, on the EO and, you know, the government, I think has, you know, CISA and, and um, the White House and uh, DOE and other agencies have done a great job, you know, the past few years of building like formal ways to integrate um, you know, asset owners and operators, and then other you know cybersecurity professionals into the process of developing policy and regulations earlier, rather than later. Like bringing us in after the fact is like, okay, well, next time we're looking to rewrite that, we'll incorporate that feedback. So bringing you know people who who are actually in the field, to, um, you know, day to day and earlier, I think is resulting in better policy. Um, I think what we need is is policy regulations that are flexible and agile, as we, we like to say, like in early stage companies that, um, you know, don't become outdated the minute that they're published, um, that can also um, flex to, you know, address the, the issues and the vulnerabilities of tomorrow as well. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. Over the last uh, probably two to three years specifically, CISA has been doing a great job of engaging the community, hiring people from the community to help lead this and, and driving some of that change. You know, I think though their regulatory mandate is somewhat limited at the moment. So, you know, they don't have the hammer, they can provide guidance. And so that's where I think we need more policy. You know, finally, we're seeing the government get involved. Now we need to give them some teeth uh, to help, you know, really make companies make changes. Is there, is there an argument for letting the market decide these issues or has that already been disproven 
As how, a, how many credit monitoring solutions do you personally already have <laughs> from, from, from when your data has been stolen? And yeah. Hacked? Oh, the you market, mean authors, right? Yeah, the market yes. has failed and it will continue to fail. I mean, all of our social security numbers were just leaked, right? The, the national public data, whatever. Um, what, they're going to send us credit monitoring again? I mean, how many different monitorings? The only ones winning are the people that are selling these credit monitoring at bulk that most of us just don't even use anymore because what's the point? If there's not better evidence that the market has failed, there you have it. I, I don't mean, know what it is. If there were only a way to encrypt data better, that wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Kate. You know, if I can, I think this is where we in this area, I think we, we tend to, to look inward a lot, right? The DMV, we look at federal solutions and federal um, mandates for things and, and, and looking at the market, especially when we think about critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, um, the, the, that's a state and local government solution. And so I think um, the market solution for that, you know, obviously, yes, it's on the, the hardware and software side too, but it's also... Um, making sure that that organizations um, who are heavily regulated already, those regulators have the subject matter expertise and the ability to um, understand budget requests that include cybersecurity services, you know, um, not the, the least cost solution, maybe it's something that, you know, is more secure, costs a little bit extra, um, but that happens, you know, outside of, of this region. And so I think when we look at the market and we look at policy solutions, we can't just look at federal um, solutions um, or, or federal, you know, or, or congressional legislative mandates. We also have to work with our partners um, in states and in, in local government to make sure that, you know, costs are reimbursable to utilities for cybersecurity investments, that they can recapture those investments and that sort of thing. So I think it is a complicated market, but it's not just in this area. We have to look sort of, you know, nationally and at, you know, state and local um, budgeting and, and, and um, legis legislative processes as well. Yeah, the, the strat, the, uh, ONCD's National Cyber Strategy that they released at the beginning of 23 covered that, as well as the software liability in the two, two sections and basically highlighted that market failure, which got to the, the liability reform I was talking about. Until you fix that, the commercial side doesn't place the right value on not leaking all of our data and not producing a defective product, right? Um, and, and on the regulated side, they aptly call out, you know, when you're in an area, take a utility whose prices are set by the government, the only way to spend more on on uh, or, or to, to drive more profits it is a race to the bottom and to cut mm -hmm. more corners. And so there's a different market for approach that they they call for in that particular section. Right. But I think the macro point is in this area, the market is not doing what it's supposed to do. It's failing. It's creating the, in, the perverse incentives to get away with the cheapest possible thing in this area and society and customers and users pay the price. We bear the brunt when a company has a massive data leak, not the company because they get a bulk deal on buying credit monitoring right now. That's the downside. And the utilities, you know, it's the same thing. They basically, you know, um, just, just say, Hey, our prices are what they are. Um, and they move on with life. So that is the role of government, I think, to help correct the market when it is failing otherwise. So one of my goals for this panel was to create a kind of dialogue or segue to the next panel of uh, government speakers. And so it sounds to me like you, if you had a chance to ask the question of the, the next panel, you would say, what, what can you do about mandating safety, right? That would be a good place to start. Okay. Yeah. And I think I say, how can we help, right? How can we work together? Because the, the government can't do it on its own. We can't do it on our own. So I mean, we got to figure out a way to do it together. Right. Right. Okay, um, so in terms of scaling, uh, in terms of scaling the development of products and services that are in your labs now, uh, to make them kind of broadly interesting uh, and available to your clients, what is your process within within your company? So, you know, in the early days when it was a small team, it was very easy. Everybody was innovative. It was easy to move fast. As you get larger and you start to scale, you have more enterprise customers that are sort of pulling you back towards more regressive features and, and less innovation. And so, you know, trying to balance those 
those innovative things against the constant fire drill of a big customer is going to churn if they don't do this or a competitor launch something and that's a problem. Um, you know, it, it's always easy to ignore that future thing, but that over time can be very corrosive. And so the way we did it um, was we created a dedicated innovation team, you know, with some, some engineers that, you know, maybe they didn't fit so well in the scrum process because they were entrepreneurial. And so in, a, in one mode, it was, they were sort of disruptive in another mode, they were, you know, the innovative geniuses. And so, you know, we, we created some teams to basically do that and help us in, iterate. And so, you know, the, the challenge with doing that, however, is then integrating that back into product, um, you know, because you can potentially end up with a not invented here problem when you bring it back to the normal engineering team. Um, and there's not a lot of great answers to that. You can do rotations and things like that. But I, I feel like at some level, that's a champagne problem. Nobody cares about the efforts that you did that didn't show any value. Nobody cares about it. It just goes away. The ones that create all the drama are the ones that the business and the customers say, that's awesome. I want that in the product, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, that, that, that drama between the teams was actually sort of a little bit of a success criteria that it, it meant that we had a thing that was important enough and innovative enough that we had to go through the tough work of figuring out how to get that into the product. Um, and so that, that's how we've done it at, at scale. What's the name of that group? Is it like a skunk, skunk works? Um, we call them labs. Labs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Kate. I think, you know, we've been much more intentional. Um, and I mentioned earlier that Dragos is, um, I think, extremely well integrated across teams. So, you know, that's everything from um, customer insights and forming the product development and product strategy to working with me and my team, um, you know, pu public policy, um, looking forward at, you know, what may or may not be coming um, or um, how can we better, um, you know, again, serve as an advocate um, in the regulatory policy making process for our customers there too. So I think it's integrating and including um, input and feedback from different teams across the company as we are developing our product strategy um, and innovating as well. Great, thank you very much. So I promised uh, our panelists that we, we would spend about 10 minutes uh, opening the floor up for questions because uh, I'm sure many members of the group uh, have a lot to offer here. So our first question is over here, this gentleman. Um, Brian, uh, <clears throat> good question for you. You've clearly thought um, deeply about the sort of pricing and liability of the software manufacturers. Um, I'm generally aligned with that. I think it's a really interesting idea. I guess my question for you, I love your sort of perspective on how does that play out for small kind of startups? Like with cloud computing, Right, you can have a group of three or four developers actually kind of building data sets that could have data on everybody. Um, and so, like, you could conceivably have very large pools of risk, reach risk, but in really, really teeny companies that don't just don't have the resources to, to do a lot of the things that might be required. So, what are your thoughts in terms of how something like that would play out in the startup business? Yeah, th so this is where I get to say I am not a lawyer. I don't have all the answers. However, um, I did write about this a little bit. And ironically, um, in the wake of the, the Key Bridge disaster, I had done some reading and um, being from the area, you guys might all be familiar with this, but um, the, the owner of the ship declared general average. And I was like, what is that? I never heard of that before. So I looked it up. And so it's this, it's this old maritime law that basically says that the, the owners of the cargo on a ship share proportionately in the risk of the voyage. Because otherwise the owner of the ship, if they're gonna carry gold bars, they're not gonna say, I'm not taking your cargo because that risk exceeds my ability to, to carry that liability. And, and so the way they solved that was this proportionality. And you know the other reason is because let's imagine the ship gets grounded on a the sandbar, they gotta start throwing cargo over to lighten the load. Why should the person whose cargo has randomly happened to be on the top of the ship carry all the burden, right? And so the general average, I think, provides a, a glimmer towards a way to do this. And so if you think about you know, the, the relative market cap of the vendor versus the customer. Take CrowdStrike and Delta as, a, as the most recent example. You know, 
a company may not be able to shield all of the responsibility for their vendor, but it doesn't mean it should be zero. Right now, it's basically zero unless they're found to be like grossly negligent, right? Um, and so I don't know if that's the answer, but I think there's a conversation to be had there. And, you know, like the example I was using for, you know, automobiles and things like that, I think other industries have solved these ways in maritime law, like thousand years ago, they solved this problem, um, you know, and, and so I think there's, there's an answer somewhere in there, but it, it can't be, I think that the software vendor only carries 100% of the liability because, yeah, you're never going to have startups anymore. Only the largest companies in the world could afford to produce software and get insurance on that risk, right? So, but it also can't be zero. So, how do you do that? It's somewhere in, in the middle. And I'm I'm going to I'm going to invite you. It's working. Uh, I'm going to invite you to join our practice. Okay. Uh, next question. Other questions, please. Yes, in the back. So in theory, the uh, CISA OMB attestation requirements went in place, I think, September. So my question is, have you seen them impact your business to prepare for it, or do you think they're going to have any impact on your business going forward? I can answer briefly. We've seen a few of them. I don't know that at this point in time it's had a huge impact to our business, but I think that's the way that we operate um, on our the, the types of services that we deliver. I think that you know you might see that a little bit more than we would at this point in time. Yeah, on the on the federal side, certainly that's a thing. Um, we haven't seen it trickle down to the commercial side yet, and it's it's still early. It's still very new. Uh, you know, I think some of the other standards in the industry, like the PCI 4.0 standard that takes effect next March may have a bigger impact because it more directly applies to, to many of the commercial side, non-fed fed sector pieces of it. You know, so um, it's, it's out there. I expect it to be an issue next year, but we haven't really seen it in a meaningful way yet. And also, you know, in terms of just general SBOM management and all the attestations, we're seeing most organizations haven't really created budget for this yet. They don't have like a czar in charge of it. Nobody knows who's responsible. It's the same problem I saw in the early days of the supply chain management where sometimes it was legal, sometimes it was security, sometimes it was development. Other questions? Comments? Matt? Brian, you mentioned a long for Jay, and I'm not sure everybody remembers Matt, but what also kind of curious to get your take and you sort of said welcome to the world we've been looking at for 12 years you didn't mention equifax or struts and that that i remember vividly in my mind being here in washington and seeing the ceo hold in front of congress and that whole drama curious you could just kind of maybe comment on that connect you yeah so uh the first first one was 2014 there was a struts vulnerability that wasn't very publicized a lot of banks conveniently went offline for maintenance at the same time um, they were attacked. They didn't announce they were attacked. Fast forward a handful of years, you had Shell Shock, Heartbleed, which really started to raise awareness and open source generally. And then Equifax, the one Matt's talking about, uh, you know, that had most of our social data leaked as a result. Um, that created a lot of attention within the regulated industries. And sure, they got hauled before Congress and a bunch of the C suite got fired. I don't know why log for shell was different. Maybe it was the combination of how widely, you know, pervasively used it was and how easy it was to exploit. And probably it was the straw that broke the camel's back. But there was a notable change when that happened because that was when all of a sudden regulators worldwide, not just here, but all over the world were basically asking questions. What is this open store stuff? Who's paying for it? Why is it? Why is nobody, you know, paying attention to it and all these kinds of things? So I don't exactly know all the reasons other than it feels like these things have to happen like two or three major times, you know, and, you know, it, I can make a prediction here. You know, we some of you may be familiar with the XZ utils uh, near miss attack. This was a nation state with alleged nation state long game attack on a popular uh, open source project 
that nearly got distributed. And this thing is in basically everything that runs Linux and Android and all these things. So like all the device devices had a backdoor planted in it that they worked on for three years. This was a very sophisticated attack that we narrowly missed. I think right now the industry is saying, great, didn't happen, awesome, on with life. I think it's gonna take two more of those before we see the collective freak out of Log4j. And I think that that's just human nature. You know, it's the how many people have to die before we take action. So, you know, I, I see history repeating itself again in, in this dimension. And I think I, I think also that there were a couple of events that, um, you know, the, the Colonial Pipeline, not an OT cybersecurity event, but it impacted public services. And so when the public feels the effects, operations are disrupted for any reason, whether they were shut down for the response efforts or not, um, it gets lawmakers' attention. It gets policymakers' attention because their constituents feel it, and then they they're aware that you know a cybersecurity issue could cause things like loss of service, or it's not just a data sort of this nebulous thing in the air anymore. They've actually felt the impact of it. So I think you know whether we agree with it or not, that sometimes has been more impactful in the public policy space. Well, we'll let Kate have the last word, and please join me in thanking Brian and Kate for their wonderful talk. <laughs>